Hello, I'm your host, Ken McDermott-Rowe, and I'm joined by In Context military affairs, affairs commentator, Marshawn McDermott-Rowe, and In Context producer, Gus Canavero. Hey. Marshawn, every sane person wishes that the rivalry between Russia and the United States won't lead to a direct military conflict. But if such a conflict were to break out, is the United States prepared for it? One of the problems is that we've been investing in counterinsurgency uh, hardware since the beginning of the Iraq war and the Afghan war. Uh, in the case of uh, drones, in terms of uh, MRAPs, armored personnel carriers, none of our hardware has been devoted to fighting a conventional war. So we're technologically speaking, not prepared. Um, in addition to, we also are not prepared in terms of numbers. Uh, just to g give you a few statistics, um, Russia has a standing army of 766,000 men. Their reserve force is roughly 2,035,000. They also have conscription, which it lasts for one year. So that means that if they truly wanted to, they could call up millions of men and women who have military training. By comparison, the U.S. has a standing army of 490,000. This is the smallest our force has been since before World War II. Our reserve is 199,000. That's not including our National Guard. But in the event of a major war, we would need our guard for the home front. So what you're seeing here is in terms of our reserve, we have a tenth the reserve that they do. In terms of our active duty, we have just a little more half than half the active duty force. In addition, the Russian military has been designed for a conventional war. When they fought the Chechens, they didn't fight even the insurgency. They fought it in a conventional fashion. You know, they met an ambush, they blew it up with a tank. You know, that, that's just the Russian way of doing business. Whereas on the other hand, our military has been very, very over-technologically focused. And you can see the inadequacies in our technology by the fact that the Russians, according to Debka file, the Israeli intelligence newsletter, brought down one of our drones over the Crimea on March 15th. Which shows that our reliance on technology is not infallible. Absolutely. And you can see that by the fact that the Iranians brought down our secret CIA RQ-170 spy drone. Possibly with the aid of Russian technology. So, you, what, so what, you, what you're implying is that our bias towards technology is perhaps not wise and that we should focus more on the boots on the ground side of our military? Absolutely. Because let's look at military history. You know, people always neglect history because they say it'll never happen again, which is the same thing they said uh, after the Hundred Years' War, same thing they said after the French and Indian Wars, same thing they said after World War I, and the same thing they're saying now post-World War II. War, the war to end all wars was World War I, right? Exactly. And we still have the same mentality. Let's not forget, Germany during World War II had the best, bar none, the best military hardware. They had the world's first jet. They had the King Tiger tank, which you could only destroy by hitting with an airplane bomb. They had the fir world's first assault rifle, the Sturmgewehr 44. And their, their he heavy and light machine guns, the MG42, was far better than our, uh, than our um, 30 caliber machine gun. V1 and V2 rockets, which put a man on the moon, by the way. But <laughs> the, the, uh, the fact is, though, is that in spite of having the best hardware, they just couldn't produce enough of it. And that's, you know, we could produce more Shermans than they could. And our Shermans were terrible compared to the German tanks. We could just produce more. And you're seeing that now with Russia. The Russian hardware that they're producing is actually pretty darn good. It's not, you know, it's not subpar to our technology. It's actually on par with our technology or, or more advanced than it. And in addition, they can produce a heck of a lot more than we can. All of our jets, all of our tanks, parts for them are made in China. How would you compare the uh, training of the average American soldier and the equipment, they say the M16, uh, compared to the training of the Russian and the, the uh, basic infantry weapon that he uses? The Russian training is much more rigorous than ours. It's much more focused on killing, too. Ours is very, very politicized. We do not do bayonet training anymore, which is anachronistic, as I remember President Obama said, you know, during World War I, we had horses and battleships. Well, let's face it, in every war, your soldiers may have to go hand to hand. <clears throat> And you may still need to use horses because during World War II, all sides used horses. Just throwing that out there. But the fact is, is that their, their training is oriented towards killing. It is oriented towards the functions of a soldier in the harshest conditions. Likewise, their Kalashnikov, the AK-12, which is what they use now, is the same thing. In fact, to test the AK-12, they have Spesnats 
which are Russian special forces, bring it with them on training exercises. And the Russians famously said, if we can create the, the world's perfect soldier, we would create a soldier like the Kalashnikov. You know, and that's, that's exactly the Russian mentality. By comparison with our army, we don't use the term kill anymore. You shoot to eliminate the threat. You know, we don't uh, do bayonet training because that's scary. It involves, you might actually have to kill somebody. We like drones. We like the touchy feely stuff. You know, blowing somebody up with a drone doesn't look like you're killing a person. You're killing a little animated guy, you know? It's like playing Call of Duty, you know? So this is a very much removed concept. Additionally, Russian soldiers in their special forces school die during training. They accept a 12% some odd death rate in their special forces training. So the Russians, because they have a surplus of people. And they get volunteers nonetheless. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. People walk up and volunteer. They have a surplus of people. And so, but this tells you something about the Russian mindset. You see this again when you look at Russian military history. Russian soldiers astounded the Germans in World War II because it would get, temperatures would get so cold that the bolts of the rifles would freeze. The machine gun actions would not be able to work because they'd be so unbearably cold. And the Germans thought there is no way enemy soldiers could be moving in this, and the Russians would still attack. So this is a mentality, a mentality. That's something that we don't train. We don't train our soldiers anymore in this kind of do or die mentality. So that's we see the 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 psychological and the technological differences. Our M42 is garbage compared to their Kalashnikov. Don't don't you end up with a staleness that happens from empire? You know we've been running an empire for decades now, and we fear no one. And we have this propaganda that is is um, uh, um, set, you know disseminated by our government and our our television and radio that America is the greatest country in the world and that we we are second to none in any category that you can possibly imagine. And Americans buy it, and by and large, they they believe that. Well, one of the you know we've been talking a lot about the the Russian American confrontation. Uh, in Europe, really over NATO's encirclement encircle of Russia. But, Marsha, on one of the technology aspects that allows Russia to protect, project its power is its advanced submarine. Could you talk mm. about the, the submarines, their ability to cross the Atlantic, and the fact that they have a base in Venezuela? Oh, yes. The Russians have established a naval base in Venezuela to re rearm and refuel their submarines. Their submarines are some of the most advanced in the world. They have the new Bore class submarine, which is the world's first silent submarine. Now, I know this sounds like someone had Tom Clancy, but it's because it is. It's a silent propulsion system. And this means that it's virtually undetectable. In addition, they, they coated their submarines with something to make it, uh, and I forget the, the material, but they coated it with a material to also make it difficult to detect on sonar. So now you have the fact that the engine's running silent on top of the fact that it's also much harder to detect as the material. And then moreover, it's equipped with the new Bulava missile. Now, the Bulava missile is, is beautiful if you're not on the receiving end of it. It has 12 independently guided warheads. And each of these independently guided warheads also carry uh, their own uh, countermeasures. So they can't be jammed. They can't be shot, or they're difficult to shoot down. And so these missiles, they, they had some tr trouble when they were first uh, tested. And the Russian government basically told the manufacturer, you're not getting a penny more until we get a finished product. And sure enough, they got a finished product because the manufacturer wanted the money. But this is not a, these are not nuclear warheads though, right? They're conventional? They could be any. They could be nucle nuclear tipped, chemical, conventional, or incendiary. To be honest, if you really wanted to wreak havoc in an urban center, but you didn't want the fallout of radiation, you use incendiary or high explosive conventional warheads, you launch them into a clustered urban city and you start major fires. It's the modern uh, modern idea of firebombing. And the advantage is because you have these silent submarines, you could dress them. Exactly. Perfect example. You could drive up along our coast. We would never know they were there. If they launch them, again, if they refuel in Venezuela and resupply in Venezuela, they can run up our east coast and they can hammer every major American city. One Bulava has 12 warheads. So if you have two of the, they each carry roughly 12 to 18 missiles, each with 12 warheads inside the, each individual missile. So one submarine could devastate every major city in the United States, let alone if you had a couple, you could decapitate our entire uh, command and control structure. So this is a very dangerous. As proof of this, we have two articles within the last uh, five or six years where, where this happened, where... There was one of these submarines that was present off the coast of San Diego when the Carnival Splendor 
had that uh, ship fire and was left stranded in the ocean for, I think it was like eight hours before our, our a Navy vessel uh, approached it. And there was a report of a Russian submarine uh, high, you know, hightailing it out of that area. And there was also another report where the Russians even admitted that they had a submarine off of Tampa Bay, Florida, that was undetected, I think, for up to uh, three months, where it was literally just sitting in the Gulf of Mexico, just checking to see if we would find it. And that's the thing is that, and that's something that the American people need to realize, is this fight that we're picking with Russia over the Ukraine has much, much wider implications. Because if Russia decided to, like that, they could decapitate our entire infrastructure, our entire military command and control structure without firing a nuclear warhead. Washington, D.C. is right on the coast. I mean, it's it's a pretty ridiculous place to put your capital in the modern day. <laughs> do our leaders, do our readers, uh, the American leaders acknowledge or are they aware of the vulnerability of this country to an attack or on its on the continental I'm going to guess no. I think, I think there's so much self-delusion that goes on. I mean, just turn on any major American media outlet. Again, all of the facts that I'm giving are all open source. People can Google this. The problem is, is our politicians don't. And neither do most, most people don't because it's, you know, it's labor intensive. They want to turn on Fox or CNN or MSNBC and see, you know, the, the uh, you know, the, the warm and fuzzy. Culture, too. We haven't been invaded since the War of 1812. Mm-hmm. So, it's, it's, so we seem to have almost a, a feeling that this could never happen. We can invade other countries, but it could never happen to us. But you also have this silly masculine, um, you know, uh, attachment to our dominance, you know, like it, that's what gets you elected by acting like you're invincible and that you're Superman, sure. you know, John Kerry and John McCain. Sure. And they're picking fights with the superpowers acting like we're invincible when you're not. And they're not on the front lines. You're never going to see well, well, relative Marshawn, affairs. Marshawn, we have to bring this, uh, this, this, to an end, this discussion to an end shortly, but could you just briefly talk about how you would change U.S. military policy in light of the threats from Russia that we've talked about? Absolutely. I would pull our forces back. I'd immediately begin consolidating our military strength, investing in conventional warfare hardware, restoring our sonar nets, investing in new submarine technology, and certainly, certainly investing much more in our National Guard and our Reserve. Because let's face it, if we get hit, it's going to be the Guard and Reserve that are going to have to take the brunt of it. And our infrastructure. Because right now, with the condition our infrastructure is in, there is no way that we can respond to one hurricane that hits the, the, that hits the East Coast and destroys New Jersey, let alone a missile attack which flattens our major cities. Not to mention, there's scarier stuff like the the Russians know. We know the Russians have uh, technology to manipulate the weather. They have talked about it. We know that they have it. We've we've read about it. They they talk about steering hurricanes. And and we didn't talk about the electromagnetic pulse bomb. The EMP bomb. I mean, the threats are limitless. Exactly. And what people have to realize, and this is, you know, the last message that I want to send to our, our viewers and our listeners is... We can't afford to pick a fight with these guys anymore. Let's drop this, you know, pseudo masculine, you know, uh, we're number one. And let's let's face reality and focus on the fact that if we don't protect ourselves, if we don't invest in our infrastructure, if we don't forget the TSA and Homeland Security, let's invest in our National Guard. Because if we don't, we could end up getting really hurt and a lot of people could end up dying needlessly. Well, thanks very much, Marshawn. That's it for the show. On behalf of In Context Military Affairs commentator Marshawn McDermott-Rowe, producer Gus Candavero, this is your host, Ken McDermott-Rowe. Thanks for listening. See you next time. See ya. (laughs) 